Hello everybody, Adam here, and before we get into today's episode, a quick announcement. We have smashed 10,000 downloads, which is a number that quite frankly boggles my mind. Thank you so, so much for listening and getting us to this milestone. As is tradition, we're going to be celebrating this with a bit of a giveaway. The rules are very simple. Interact with us via Facebook or Twitter with your suggestion for an advert for an IC product for us to do as one of our sponsors. Use the hashtag FMPod10K so we can find them all. The winner will not only receive some fabulous prizes that I'll come on to in a moment, but also we will work on getting that product into one of our sponsorship parts at the start of the show. As far as prizes go, we have got a doozy for you. The first is courtesy of Mal and Liz Hazel and the Smoking Banther crew, who, as you probably picked up from the various shout outs we've done are some of our biggest supporters they have provided us with a copy of special modifications which is probably the best source book across all of the star wars lines we also are going to hopefully have something very very special from our partners at board game solutions more on that when i hear back from them but if they can pull off what we're hoping they can pull off it's gonna be pretty sweet Our patrons are automatically entered into any of the competitions we do, but that doesn't mean they can't enter again. We like to hear your suggestions. And if you want to be a patron of the show, find us at patreon.com slash force majeure pod. The competition is open to all our listeners, no matter where in the world you are. International shipping will be covered because we love you all very much equally. Right, that's more than enough of my nonsense. Let's get this on the road. You know how it goes. A long time ago in the galaxy far far away. You're listening to Force Majeure, an actual play Star Wars podcast. My name is Adam and I'm your host, and today's episode will be brought to you after these words from our sponsors. I've delved deep into the mountains and seen sights the like of which you can't imagine. I've traded with the elves for their sungwood artifacts, swapped mechanisms and trinkets with gnomes, and forged legendary items me very own self on this humble anvil. But never in all my years of life have I found gaming aids quite like those made at the Silverwing Armory. There's adventure journals, both lined and dotted, to record the tale of your days or your idle thoughts. There's note cards for sending letters to those you care about. There's spell cards, so those magically inclined among you can have a quick handy reference for all your tricks. And not just for Dungeons and Dragons, but Genesis as well. And above all, there's the beautiful artwork, both existing and bespoke to fit your needs. The Lady V will look after you, and help make whatever you need to level up your game, all at a great price and with excellent customer service. Find the Armoury online at silverwingarmoury.com and on Twitter at SArmoury. There's also going to be a link in the show notes of this episode. And remember, because we're in Canada, that's got the superfluous you in there and all. Spend your hoard wisely. Go see the Silverwing. Hello everybody and welcome back. This is Adam, the GM for the Cold Fire Chronicles and this is episode 7. I'm joined round the table by... I'm Ross, I'm playing Agatha, a morale and warrior aggressor, whose emotional strength is his pride but whose weakness is his anger. My name's Ed Fortune and I play the character Auburn Brick. He is a human hunter seeker. His emotional strength is his thirst for justice and his emotional weakness is his penchant for cruelty. Hi, I'm Mim. I play Lassa. She is a human sentinel artisan. Her strength is her curiosity and her weakness is obsession. Hi, I'm Mikey. I play Jiren, a Chiss mystic advisor. His emotional strength is his enthusiasm, but his emotional weakness is his recklessness. So today, before we start off back into the adventure properly, it seems an appropriate point in time to check in with our players' conflict and morality scores, given what's been going on. So I think I'm going to be starting with Lassa. I don't know why you'd look at me. Okay, so it was fairly apparent that you found what had been going on fairly distasteful. 
Absolutely. Okay. I was shocked and appalled. So, how are you feeling? How is Lassa feeling when you sit back and contemplate that if it wasn't for your deciding vote, clearly cast out of spite, that whole episode would never have happened? If you remember back, Oberon and Agatha were very, very much up for it. Jiren was very much not. And you looked him dead in the eyes, realised how little Jiren wanted to do this, and then voted I. How's Lassa feeling about that? She's very conflicted. Uh, Her head's a little confused. To be completely honest, what I fully expected was that we'd go out and we'd get into some kind of trouble and I'd pull him out of it. You know, I figured that Jiren would learn a little bit of humility. I thought the other boys, they'd maybe learn to work together as a team and we'd solve a small problem, but mostly I'd be there to steer them on the straight and proper. And I'll admit, I saw things I didn't want to. I saw things I never wanted to see and I did things I didn't want to do. My whole experience is somewhat shaken. My hope was we were going to go down there, find out that there were some evil droids, I was going to knock them out, reprogram them, and then we'd go home. I didn't actually think we were going to end up fighting for our lives against two creatures that we shouldn't have been fighting. I didn't think we were going to get that far. I thought it was going to be humans jumping us. I didn't realise they were going to let animals do their dirty work, and I didn't realise that they were going to have so much fun bashing them to death instead of a simple put-down. I mean, it was difficult, yes, and now I'm very angry. And I can't be angry at the people I've got to be angry with because I work with them but I can be incredibly angry at the people who put us in that situation, and I'm going to fix it. And following on from that point, now, at the point that you'd arrived at Port Haven, you'd settled in, you'd made your deal with Hawker, and it seemed like some of that distrust, some of that tension that had been building in the group had kind of been put to rest a little bit, like there was now some bonds of trust and faith building. What's Lass's view on the rest of the crew at this point in time? We are a crew, and a crew's got to work together to keep a ship flying and I've worked with people I don't get on with before and whom I disagree with before and I can keep it professional. I can keep it compartmentalised but that doesn't mean I'm not going to do something and like I said I've got plans to fix the problem even if I can't fix it as swiftly as I might like to with the people that I'm working with. Oberon shocked me. Agatha I kind of didn't expect much from. There's something there but you know they're, they're different than most people. I understand that and it can be frightening, but I can understand that. Oberon, he got, he was so upset that he'd done something wrong and then he realised, I realised, he wasn't upset at the right thing. He was upset because, oh, it's killed a breeding pair. Oh dear, that's ethically wrong. Like, oh, don't mind the shooting and the stabbing and the slow death and that smile. He had a smile, but I can deal with that. We can put that in the right direction. And we'll slowly work on him, because I can't grab him by the throat, bash him against the wall and tell him to put some sense in him. Okay. And you didn't spend any dark side points, so your morality hit at the moment, your conflict, is five. Can you please roll me a d10? I rolled a seven. So your morality, at the end of that, goes up by two. You have faced what you've done, and you're coming out stronger for it with more purpose. So if you want to uh, mark that up, your morality has actually somehow increased by two. That is pure pig-headed stubbornness. Thank you so much. Now, speaking of pure pig-headed stubbornness and also evil malicious smiles, Oberon, I should make it perfectly clear at the starting point that when we're discussing the conflict that you've accrued, I'm not factoring in that you wanted to go on a hunt in the first place because you're a hunter. I don't think it's right to penalise you quite so much for that core of your character because it's not inherently immoral. It's not inherently leaning towards the dark side to want to go on a hunt. But as Mim has said, you surrendered more than anyone else around this table to your emotional weakness. Not once, but twice. You embraced that cruel core of you. You embraced that maliciousness. And you made no secret that you were shooting to wound. You made no secret that you were shooting dirty. What's Oberon's feeling now that this whole situation has resolved itself in the way that it has? So Oberon still hasn't quite woken up properly. He's still in the process of figuring out who he is. And he's one of those people who's trying to do the right thing, but in the wrong ways at the moment, because he doesn't know where where he fits. And up to this point, hunting things was pure. Hunting things is easy. He knows how to do that, and it's him versus the world. And the world doesn't care. 
so he doesn't have to care. He doesn't have to think. And what he's done is he's opened himself up in front of people he trusts and suddenly realised that maybe he didn't want to do that because he doesn't like who he is. So he's trying to figure out where he fits and what he needs to do next. So he's very conflicted. That's kind of the point. But he also realises that he's pitted himself against creatures and he's won. And that's the way that's supposed to work. But he also realises that there's a challenge coming and he can't afford to indulge anything other than his sense of justice. He's got to engage on a positive level, otherwise he, he'll lose. Because if he becomes cruel, then he's his father. And then his father wins. And then his family wins. And then he might as well have never left. He might as well have never stopped. So he has to figure that out. And he doesn't know how. how and he doesn't have a map because there's no territory for this. But something in his brain has opened up. Something. It's not his brain. It's some something in his soul at this point is beginning to open up. I mean, he doesn't know what it is. He's not scared of it. He just doesn't know what the plan is. And at that point, he's at his most dangerous. And taking the group out on the hunt in the first place. I know it's been kind of touched on with some of our in-character questions, but what was Oberon's thinking behind that? That's what families do. Yeah, in fairness, given your background, that's probably not a surprising answer, really. Okay. It will probably not come as a surprise to you that your conflict that you've accrued, you've also spent some dark side points last few sessions, your conflict is nine. Ooh, I rolled a two. So you lose seven points of morality. Oh my goodness. I only had 45. Join us. <laughs> You're going to need to pull yourself up by your socks there, Chief. Otherwise, we're going to have our first Sith in the party, I think. Hey. We're only halfway through season two. <laughs> Moving on to um, other Sith in the party. Uh, <laughs> Jiren. <laughs> Hello, how are you? See, you didn't want to go. Can I point something out? Of course. Just before you go any further. Jiren tricked Lasser into going. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> You're saying he didn't want to go. <laughs> yeah, you write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to have an impact, Chief. I know. <laughs> so, and, However, he didn't want to go hunting. He wanted to go and go on an adventure where he solved why people were being killed and things like that. He had no interest in the hunt. So that was your motivation behind? Yeah, yeah he, was, he was surprised when we actually started hunting. He was waiting for us to attack the droid. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just why he was like, what, what's going on? Well, I mean, yeah, that that came a little bit later mm -hmm. than, than intended. Uh, if Lassa hadn't reached that breaking point, yeah. what would you have done if after that was, after, after the lizards had died and Steve had managed to arrange a sled to come and collect them and send them to the taxiderma list and then suddenly the Coldfire's Mercy would have a beautiful new rug? What would Joran have done? He would have been a bit confused and he would have probably brought everybody together and gone, oh, why haven't we done what we were said we were going to do? Because there is not, we weren't here to do hunting. We were the only reason. The only reason, if you remember, the only reason that Jiren got interested is because there was the potential for a mystery to be solved in the fact that people were going and not coming back, and that's what he was interested in. And it was kind of baffling. He has no way of damaging or even affecting a droid, so he was kind of waiting for it to kick in, and then we suddenly were hunting, and it was a bit odd. Okay. But no, he, he regrets, seeing as he knows how much he's affected Lasser, he regrets tipping the scale, because while Lasser thinks she tipped the scale, he made sure he looked like he didn't want to go, so Lasser then did want to go. Righto, and you did use some dark side points as well. Yes, I did. I so, scared off some little compies. So your morality, uh, your conflict hit, is three. Because I'm aware that while you were actually there, what you then did was do your best to do no harm, almost. So... Mm. That, well, that's been this is the thing about Duran. While he's a criminal, he's like a Robin Hood style thing. He doesn't want to do any harm. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He just wants to be cool and be a criminal and then go away into. And people go, Who's that masked man in the resplendent coat? He's all about style and not much about substance. Uh, I'm going to do a roll now. Oh, I rolled a 10. So your morality goes up by seven. Excellent. You are on the, on the right path at the moment, then, clearly. And moving on to people who are not on the right path. Agatha is listening. <laughs> <laughs> I had personally gotten the impression, as we were coming off Daxos and you got to, um, to Port Haven, that while Agatha liked to fight, it was more that challenge of pitting himself against another creature, almost in the same way that Oberon likes to hunt. 
But when the concept of hunting first came up, Agatha was very, very clear that what he wanted to do was kill something. It had been too long since he'd killed something, his knuckles were getting itchy, and he wanted to go out and murder something and didn't really care much what. That was certainly how you came across, or how Agatha came across, in the conversation when it was first being mooted. Would you say that was a fair assessment of Agatha? Well, it's deep, this, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not just scraping the surface here. I I'm... didn't think you were. No, I, I've been listening to everybody else's answers. I didn't think you were. Well, everybody else really kind of wears their heart on their sleeve, and I kind of get the feeling that Agatha wears an amount of themselves quite up front, but there's a lot more going on behind those cold, dead, shark-like eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're by, biased or by, by which You I, think Agatha has depths? I was going to say, by which I should stress, I mean, Agatha's cold, dead, shark like eyes. Your cold, dead, shark like eyes are beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> but no, I, I I'm do... not sure Agatha has that much depth, no. <laughs> well, you know, um, let's just skim the surface then. So, but yeah, where was, where was Agatha thinking then? Agatha liked the challenge, and he wasn't the one who came up with the idea. This, that was Oberon. But when the concept of we're going to go hunting okay, we'll be going to go and kill a thing then, aren't we? That's been Agatha's thing all along. He's been very prideful about the fact he's fought some big things and he's won. He's been in prison for doing one of those. He's fought, was it a snow demon now? He's fought some wolves, big he's lizards. fought these huge lizards. He's fought a pie jack, which was you know, not what he anticipated, but he's, he's fought some impressive things. At the moment, he's still chasing the, not exactly trophy, I'm not sure what you'd call it if, you, if it's trophies, if he wears them on his face, but- It's still he's, trophy hunting. Yeah, it's still, in a sense, it's still trophy hunting, but he doesn't, have a morality about it. Yeah. He's going to be concerned soon that everybody else has become a very depressed about it, but it was very simple for him. That's what Oberon wanted us to do. That's what we went and did. So Agatha is kind of not picking up on the um, the, the subtext of the conversation since you've gotten back to Coldfire's Mercy then. In fairness, Agatha has been bruised and in pain and wasn't involved in any of the droid bashing that happened after the, the killing of the lizard. <laughs> no, you're... Ag- Agatha was mostly groaning on the floor going, well, we survived it and I won, but... Ow. <laughs> could could please have med pack now, thank you. Yes. Okay. So he hasn't caught up with that part of it yet. I'm sure someone will remind him. In fact, no, I'm sure everyone will remind him very soon that oh, that might not have been what the the thing. I guess picturing you walking down to breakfast the next morning whistling a jaunty tune, whereas everyone else is avoiding eye contact and not looking at each other and eating their breakfast quietly. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, balancing that. You did use some dark side points as well. Your um, starting kind of conflict hit is five. Okay. So if you roll your d10 for me, please. Okay. I have rolled two. So your morality goes down by three. Yep. So that out of the way, we star wipe in the next morning, cold fires mercy at breakfast time. As our heroes are waking themselves up to the smell of Prinkle cooking a fine breakfast, Let's see what our destiny pool is for the next few episodes. I have one dark side. Typical. I have one light side point. That's not so typical. I have two light side points because I'm typical. a good girl. And I have one dark side. And I have one dark side. So that's three light side. And three dark three side. Three dark side. The force is surprisingly balanced. Marvellous. We star wipe two. The common area of Coldfire's mercy. The smell of Prinkle's cooked meat breakfast pervades through the atmosphere, which is still a little bit stale in here. It's not been fully pumped out yet. That's going to be happening today under the watchful eyes, presumably, of Lassa, as will the rest of the supplies being loaded to be taken to Lenico 4 and your rebel contact. Tugger has spent the night quite comfortably plugged into his astromech socket, charging up with Mr. Sparkles curled up asleep on his head. As you suspect, it's going to be the way of things from here on out. You've all spent the evening in your rooms. Uh, Lassa locked in the engineering room, which I suspect is becoming her de facto bunk room rather than one of the actual bunk rooms set aside for her. Oh yes, there's a comfy chair in there that you get the impression that she might happily sleep in it. Having been lulled to sleep by the soothing sounds of the life support systems. You can hear Prinkle singing quietly to himself as he cooks. You can hear the sounds of Pijak in the kind of training area stroke barracks room that used to be the other cargo hold on Coldfire's Mercy as he's going through his morning drill and his morning exercises, echoing throughout the ship. Just so you know, uh, in terms of timeline-wise, it is expected that all of your supplies will be loaded up by the end of today. 
the atmospheric scrubs will have been replaced and the kind of bottled atmosphere will have been pumped out and replaced. Obviously some of that's going out anyway just because you're now on a new world and you've got your doors open, but the kind of the emergency reserves will have been fully replaced by the time that you get ready to go. The, the ship will be completely refuelled and tomorrow morning, assuming that you wait that long, you'll be able to take off and make your journey. I suppose it all depends on how today goes and how tired you are by the end of it. Mm-hmm. That's the timetable. Who's up first? What are you all doing? Duran's certainly up when we start wiping. He's at the main table. And slowly, food's getting placed on the main table, but he's kind of pulled off an area, and he's got his sabac deck out, and he's playing cards with Tugger. And they've both got a pile of chips, and slowly, Tugger's chips get larger, and Duran's chips getting smaller, because Duran can't cheat droids. They don't have a poker face. They don't have a poker face. They don't have a face. Or at least this exactly. One doesn't. He's taking it quite well, but you can quite easily see that he's basically killing time while everybody else does stuff. And saying things like, I wonder if did you get three of those? I, 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 just take it. Take it. I, I, it, 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 is, it is right. More, 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 more. Very occasionally, Mr. Sparkle leans over from his mobile bed on top of, of the Roomba that is Tugger's head and bats one of the Tower of Chips over and then curls back down, looking very, very pleased with himself. Your hat is getting in the way of the game. More, 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 more. Thing on your head. More, more, more. Hey, never mind. Meow. It it, it is fine. It it suits you. It really does. More, more. Auburn has a a large hot cup of something black and steaming. He's moving food around on the plate. At some point, Mr. Sparkles will figure out that he's not eating anything and realise that Auburn is an easy mark. And it'll be a case of the, the cat will just turn up and absentmindedly he'll just be taking food off the wherever the main area is, putting it onto his plate and then putting it into the cat. If you see what I mean. Stop helping, I'm losing. But he's he's clearly elsewhere. Agatha comes down to breakfast and starts eating. <laughs> <laughs> Big shovelfuls of yeah. food going straight in. So far, Agatha's fine. He'll, I, he'll, he'll pay attention to the rest of you in a minute. But I, imagine, minute food. I imagine that whilst the food is being chewed, another shovelful is, is getting ready, so there's no break in between. Yeah. No, no, there's pauses, but that's mostly because he's bruised all over because he got you know, really, really beaten up. Are you mostly pausing to smack your lips and then continue to eat? Um, I think he's mostly pausing because his arms are going to be slightly bruised and stuff, and he's you know, still got to pick things up. It's not like he's a heavy weight, it's just painful. Lassa has been awake, but she hasn't left the engineering room. She did sleep there last night, she didn't go back to her own quarters. There's some cold cups of, could be tea, could be coffee, could be oil, to be completely honest. It's that thick in the cup next to her, and it's completely cold. She's been fiddling around with a droid head, there's some wires going into it. Mostly, it looks like she she hasn't managed to do anything to it yet, but she's clearly been setting some stuff up, not that any of you can see it, and she will potter out to pick up some breakfast, say good morning to Prinkle, nod good morning to the table, and then go back into engineering. But she will try and catch Jaren's eye to nod that she'd like to have to speak with him. Uh, just one second. Ah, uh, half sub. How on earth did you get full sub? More, 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 more. I'm coming. You just take them all. It's this way. Tugger's little manipulator arms pop out and start scooping the pile of chips towards him. Then he realises he doesn't have any pockets and kind of looks a little bit forlorn. More, 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 more. Mm. Cannot believe I've been fleeced by a droid. I'm slightly disappointed you didn't you know, automatically just scoop them onto the floor. <laughs> he has already learned in his brief period association to be very afraid of Prinkle and his broom. <laughs> <laughs> Prinkle versus Tugger, next episode. Fight! So Jiren, with his tea-flavoured calf, wanders into the engineering room and leans against a wall. Morning. Um, Morning. You remember last night and you were sorting out the inventory? Yeah. Do we have any of these in our inventory? She takes a piece of scrap paper and writes down, in quite large letters, I'm not sure what communications are bugged. I don't know if it's just off-ship. How do we tell Agatha and Oberon without letting everyone know. Oh, that is very complicated. I know, it's not, a tricky part. Not a great engineer, so I don't really know what that means. Um, okay, um, yeah. Right. How do we... Yeah. I, mean, I, I could... don't think we have. I think I should probably have a look. Um, the, um, he looks around the engineering room. He doesn't know anything about it, uh, really, but uh, you've got a lot of noisy equipment in here, right? Oh, aye, this place can be deafening sometimes. He raises an eyebrow. 
That could be a plan. All right, do you want to bring them in here and I'll show them the parts I need? I'll, um, I'll go and see if the, um, if the parts are available and we'll see what's what. And give me a moment. Potter's out. And without saying a word, just pokes at Oberon, just on his shoulder. I was somewhere else entirely. How can I help you? Come with me. Have you finished? These points at Agatha. Agatha's finished. Come with me. More, 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 more. Um, you come in. No, wait. No. Um, you, you don't want to see. Droid head. Nasty. Um, more, 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 more. I don't understand. Does anybody understand droids? Yes. One moment. I, I put the cat on the droid's head again. More, more, more. I, and I seem to think that's fixed it. I, I think <laughs> I think I know why I wasn't winning. I don't really understand what he says. Okay, you stay here. If you can tidy up the plates. Thank you. Great. And I'll wander, we'll wander into there. More. With all four of you in the engineering room, it is very crowded. At the moment, it's it's noisy, but it's not deafeningly loud. It's certainly not as loud as the, the kind of maintenance and pump station room was in the Imperial base. But it's getting to that kind of level... It's more of a gentle throbbing hum at the moment as life support systems start ticking over and the air filters are working and there's basic fuel pumping going into the engines to make sure that they they keep idling over. It's a comforting noise at the moment. It's quite a warm and and cosy place, but yeah, there's not really a lot of places for everyone to sit, especially considering how big Agatha is. And no one is getting in my chair. It's mine. Right, well, okay, there are some parts that we need to look for and I thought it might be easier if I draw you a picture and again she flips over the other side of the paper and writes we've been bugged not sure if internal or ext comms be careful and holds it up oh ah you think you can recognise these where are those parts from any idea uh I don't we might be able to find them on Port Haven they almost certainly could be available on Port Haven, but I don't know where from. I think if we look through the things that have been brought in recently, we might be able to find the, the part we need. Okay. And I don't want to go to Hawker about it, you know, because she's done so much for us at the moment, and these are things that more, really... More than we would have expected, I would say. Far more. And, you know, it's such a trifle to trifle her with. We already owe her so much. Certainly we don't want to be... Uh, pushing anything until until we've, we've made some sort of amends with her. Agatha is taking everything at the minute at face value rather than subtext. <laughs> this is why. He was watching the side, <laughs> but he started looking around for parts as well. <laughs> this is why Jaren's talking directly at Oberon and hasn't really spoken to Agatha yet. Okay. Anyway, I think we should probably start looking for these once we're off planet, you know, maybe some... some yeah. Scavenging, I, I, Not I, bother about it on Port Haven, she says, looking straight at Agatha. But we'll think about all this when we're off-world, Agatha. Yeah. We, uh, we don't want to be making any changes while we're here, because it might have repercussions to us taking off. Oh, no, I understand, yes. Yeah. yeah. Agatha. <laughs> Agatha understands. Right. Agatha probably doesn't quite understand yet, but we'll get there. I'm sure it's fine. We ha- it's not like we haven't had to improvise before. Oh, yeah. yeah. Many hands make light work, as they say. Anyway, I'm going to be... Uh, Mesolisk proverb, yes. I'm going to be working a lot in the engineering today. I'll be checking over the atmospheres, making sure that all our carbon scrubbers and things are replaced. I'm going to be watching over that, but, uh, yeah, you won't see much of me today. Oblon points at the robot head, which I think is there. Yeah. I'm working on it. Is, is that in hand? Oh, it's in hand. Anything I can do to help? Absolutely not. It's all right. I'm going to go through the supplies and see what we're, we're getting in. Agatha, I might need you for heavy lifting, if that is okay. Agatha will help. Oberon, what, what is your plan for the day? Well, as much as I'm very, very willing to be able to help here, I think I'm completely useless. I don't say that. self actualization is a very important thing. My skills are more using things at work rather than making things work or making things not work. Maybe you can get um, acclimatised with the piloting. Because we haven't really investigated the ship so much. I can certainly figure out... Sort out the pilot seat uh, levels and get comfortable. I don't, I don't know. I'd you mean pre program manoeuvres and pre program emergency procedures? I can do that. There's a second where you realise that that's not what Duren meant, because Duren doesn't know what that means. But it's only a brief flash, and he goes, yes, exactly that. I might advise, says Lassa, looking at... Looking softly at Oberon and then looking away, not maintaining eye contact. 
She starts busying around with things on the table. But I uh, would possibly recommend Oberon going and talking to Pijak, because he's had a rough time lately, and he might be able to, I don't know, give you a little bit of peace. He's got a way with words, and it's not like he hasn't done some disappointing things. There's a lot going through his mind at the moment. He's spending a lot of time training. I'm not saying that sitting on the floor with your legs crossed going oom like a, some kind of vibrating plant is going to be any use, but... Pijak has had his mind messed with, and I know how much that affects people. Pijak's experienced betrayal on every single level to his upbringing. That's something I understand. Go speak to him. See if you can help. He might be able to help you, you don't know. Plus he's kind of smart with weapons and stuff. You guys have probably got a lot in common. Oh, I should get a bullet. I should get a bullet for my gun. You mean ammo? No, uh, why would I need more than one? Anyway, it's not important. So, we need to have a conversation. And the conversation we need to have is about equipping you with something that makes sure that you survive conflict. He looks around at all of you with bats and bruises and having goes, Yes, that is clearly a problem for me. (laughs) (laughs) J-Rad has something which will help him survive a conflict. He has the other three of us. (laughs) Oh, we're not always going to be here, and you're not very good at it. Uh, 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 you, you, sometimes running away will not work. I don't run away. I walk towards, smiling. Can you possibly walk towards the exit of my quite small, lovely engineering suite? But it's warm go- in here. It is. It's lovely, isn't it? I like it. It's a cosy atmosphere. It's about to get much warmer, because there's three of us. Four of us. Four of us. I'd like it if there were three less of you. Five of us. And take that cat out of here. I thought we left that cat on the droid. Wow. When did the cat arrive? How did the cat get in? The cat is, uh, Mr. Sparkles, is on the workbench, batting at the droid head. Nope. No, 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 no. This Meow. out. All of you out. You've all got jobs to do. Agatha grabs the cat. Meow. How many cats do we have? One. Are you sure? There was one on the tugger before he walks out of the room. No, no, he's not there anymore. We don't have cats on Jeez. Everywhere else has something like that. Right, Lassa is now pushing you towards the door, out of the way. I've got work to do. Just calm me when they come in for the final atmosphere cleansing, all right? Okay. I want to make sure they're not doing anything that I would not support as an engineer, she says, putting her hand against her head and realising she was about to say something out loud stupid. You are a control freak and you wish to control things. I understand that completely. She just shuts the door in your face. Bye-bye. Yes, you control this conversation. What? No, no, it's it's fine, Joran. It's nothing I can actually explain to you. Yes, life's little mysteries. He wanders off. Agatha follows, cat in hand. Okay, no, cat on shoulder. Let's be nice. But <laughs> Oberon goes and hangs out with Pijak, if Pijak is in the mood to be hung out with. Yeah, Pijak's certainly in a lot better mental state than he was when you first properly negotiated with Hawker. Yesterday, he appears to have spent doing very little except meditating. And he's certainly a lot more relaxed. When you make it to the the training room area of the cargo bay, Pijak is there. He certainly seems to be in a much better mental state than he was the last time you, well, certainly Agatha saw him. He's in a pair of sweatpants and a vest top, and he's practicing bare knuckle sparring against like a, 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 a hanging down, you know, one of the big training like boxing training bags yeah. that he's suspended from a cargo hook on the ceiling and he's working that bag at the moment given his age he's very fluid again the contrasts between how Agatha fights which is like a bear it's all power and aggression and everything into each strike in the hopes that the combat ends he's very fast he's very quick there's a lot of kicking in there as well as punching there's some elbow strikes he's clearly an accomplished martial artist of some form and he he's completely focused at the moment on the heavy bag because it's appropriately cinematic I will pick up some pads and go into that boxing training style thing so you know he's giving me a but he's not giving me a beat down. I'm I'm moving and trying to get him to keep his defences up. When he sees you come and he sees you kind of pick up the pads, he moves away from the bag, gives you a nod, and then starts sparring. Good day, Abron. How are you today? Here you had quite an eventful one yesterday. Yes, that was both what I needed and also incredibly disappointing. Looks like you need to get something off your mind. Do you want to swap over? Yes, if you don't mind. Nah, of course not, mate. So... Turns out, Oberon really knows how to fight. It's a dirty style. In Tales to Astonish, Oberon's fighting style is a little bit dirty. It's a little bit dirty. It's allowed, but it's like... And only when it's pointed out that he's like, kind of acknowledges it in a kind of, oh, that makes sense. 
sort of way and like adjusts but it's not like he's actively cheating yeah if you see what I mean it's that he's more used to he's been taught how to win not how to spar yes okay and as you're attacking Pijack with these pads on you look like you've got a lot on your mind Oberon you want to talk? a little bit just a little bit I'm not really good at this nothing's easy things used to be simple I was in one place, I was part of the world, and the world worked in a way that was to my advantage. Then I realised that was wrong, because the world is more complicated than that. I just walked my friends into a trap yesterday. I walked them into a trap, thinking that we'd be able to get out of the trap easily. And what I'd realised is that that it wasn't a conspiracy, there wasn't some complicated scheme going on. It was just bad people being bad. And through their negligence and their uncaring, they created creatures that are just creatures. They eat, they kill, they make other creatures, and they turned them into monsters. We were hunting breeding pears. We were helping raise monsters. You hunt breeding pear, breeding pear survives. How does it raise its children? To eat people, to hunt, to become monsters. Well, I've not got a lot of experience on the hunting of beasts, so I defer to your wisdom on that second point. But what I will say, I've been around for a long time. I've seen a fair amount of stuff. And I've never yet found a worse monster than people. People are complicated. And sometimes people do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And sometimes people do the wrong thing for the right reasons. And sometimes people just enjoy doing the wrong thing for their own reasons, which to us are wrong. But to them, they're they're justified in what they're doing. Animals, at least, they, they do with what they know. You know, they go with their instinct. But people doesn't matter what world you hail from, what species you are, what you look like. We're complicated, mate. And it seems to me like you need to consider yourself where you want to be and who you want to be. You need to look at who you are now and decide if that's the road you want to carry on walking. I've always felt it was easier to picture myself as just another animal and that made things easier. And now that I've realised it's not that easy, things have become simpler in a much more complicated way. That's going to take a while to understand, I think. And there's a pause. There's quite a bit of action, shall we say. And then they go, nothing's criffing easy, is it, Padre? He kind of lowers the pads by this point and runs the back of his hand across his very, very sweaty brow. Ain't that the criffin' truth? I think think that might end up on my uh, tomb. You might want to maybe sit down and have a think. Meditation room three if you wanted, mate. I will stop stealing the scene and go into the meditation room. Starwipe to Jiren and Agatha doing all of the stuff, and Jiren says, This is criffing, easy, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> As the day progressed, if you all are staying on coal fire's mercy, at about 10 o'clock space standard time in the morning, two loader droids arrive with a pair of bothans who are both looking very unhappy about the heat. You know, they've got little sweatbands on, the overalls they're wearing have clearly got cold water bottles in, you know, they've shaved parts of themselves just to kind of get a little bit of relief, like tongs hanging out the side of the muzzles. They've got an awful lot of crates, some of which are on grav lifts, and others are just being carried by these load lifters. And under your supervision, they start moving these into the cargo bay, setting them in, maglocking them to the floor. As soon as they arrive, Duran gets on the comm and tells um, Lasser that they're here to moving stuff in. Are you supervising the Bullfunds to make sure they're okay? I'm not giving them any blue dice, I'll tell you that, but I am supervising them. (laughs) Maybe they've got a black because I'm helping. (laughs) It's because two is enough to be many and you have to be very careful. (laughs) Yes. So, no, he's going, no, you should put that here. Oh, no, actually, maybe here over here. No, wait a minute. Lasso, where are we putting this? Oh, uh, I think they should all go in the hold. Back in the original place, I'm terribly sorry. And so it takes a little bit more time. Yeah, but they, under your supervision, they're kind of loading them in. You got the manifest from Tugger, yeah. so, and what's being brought in, you're checking it off yeah. as you go in your quartermasterly role. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what they're bringing in is, is, is exactly as euphemistically named as it suggests. If you look in any of the crates, yeah. the Bothans are a bit like, hey, shouldn't be doing that, but you know what? I don't care, my manifest is to bring it in, and what happens next is on you, that sunshine. If they push any further... Yeah, that's how Bothans speak in my world. Don't give me that look. I I just want to check. Are these Bothans wearing flat caps and also wearing brown overcoats? Absolutely they are, yeah. Uh If they push me not to look in them, then I will make it okay. But at the moment, I'm fine. I'm going to be rooting through. Could I roll either a Skullduggery or an Underworld 
roll to see if I can uh, spot any. Yeah. You know, I'm looking for false backs or anything like that. Anything that shouldn't be there. But not a great deal of trust in yeah, this. Yeah, either of those, they both seem pertinent to what you're doing. The difficulty is going to be two purple. Yeah. I'm going to give you a boost die because you're quite alert for shifty stuff and with mm. your experience, you know kind of where to look. Yeah. But I'm going to put in two setback die because it's under the watchful eyes of these Bothans. Yeah. And also, the stuff that's being brought in is professionally smuggled. Yeah. You know, there are false backs in there because what it says is cold winter garb yeah. is only cold winter garb until you hit the false bottom and yeah. then you find the weaponry that is actually being smuggled in. If I find anything, I'm not telling anybody yeah. else about it because my poker face is a lot better than that. Yep. Apart from Togo, who's so better than mine. <laughs> okay, so that is, with all of those dice, just one success, nothing else, it all wipes out otherwise. There is nothing that you can find in the crates that you have time to go through that is unexpected yeah. from what it is that you know that you're doing. We are smuggling stuff, but there's nothing yeah. extra smuggled. Yeah, the stuff that, that you are smuggling is the stuff that you expected to yeah. be smuggling. Yeah. There's no additional bugs, no time-delayed explosives yeah. waiting for a trigger signal, okay. no homing beacons that will draw the Empire to you, yeah. nothing above and beyond what you, what you are aware that you're bringing. Excellent. Round about one o'clock in the afternoon, a basilisk arrives with two droids directly behind him. They're not quite load lifter droids, they're not that level of huge hulking, but they are carrying a number of crates of spare parts and some atmospheric bottles. They explain to you, I mean we're montaging our way through yeah. this sort of thing, they explain to you that they're here to start replacing the carbon scrubbers, replace the essential life support filters and that sort of thing. Oh, you're playing my tune. If I can tag along with you just to see that everything's properly installed also, it gives me a chance to have a look while you're having a look. You know, I can bounce ideas off you if need be. Oh, hey, no problem with that at all, lassie. Come along then. Oi, you two. He clicks at the droids and then in binary he goes, Right, you follow along here. You'd know what you're supposed to be doing. Click, click, whir, whir, beep, beep. <laughs> yeah. And then commences undertaking the sort of repairs and replacements that you know they're doing. Do you want to kind of maybe make a mechanics test just to represent you keeping an eye on them, knowing what you're looking for and making sure they're, they're doing it right? Yes, please. Sure Okie dokie. Again, I think this is going to be standard difficulty, so two purple. Two purple? This is mechanics, isn't it? It is mechanics. I'm going to throw in for this one a single setback die because this is a very, very, very old ship. And though you know your way around some old ships... This is sufficiently old that some of the things that you're expecting to find in places aren't in those places, and some of the places that you do find them are not where you're used to them being. And you don't have a Haynes manual for this ship just yet, so you're kind of finding your way around, but that's why there's a setback die, just because it's, right. it's a bit too old, archaic compared to what you're expecting. That's two flat successes. Okay. They are not doing anything illicit. Brilliant. They are doing exactly what you expect them to do. They're making a few minor repairs on the way, replacing a few bits, getting rid of some rust in areas that you didn't know that were there. And more importantly, throughout them doing this, you have learned a little bit more about how the ship's put together. Brilliant. So you're a little bit more confident about making repairs on the fly yourself as, as you kind of go along. I don't know if, if this is possible, but I would like to, while this guy is here, obviously buffing him up with lovely hot tea and some leftover breakfast, whatever we've got, to see if there's any things that you shouldn't do, but you can do. You kind of shouldn't, but it might save you time. Like, for example, you can't reuse a fully broken carbonizer. The idea is that it's been used up, all the carbon, blah, 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 that's it. But, say maybe, you shouldn't do it, but if you want it to work for an extra couple of hours, you could dunk it in battery acid or something. I'd like any little tricks like that that I might be able to put away for later. Are yeah. you going to have to roll a charm roll now? Yeah, I think so. Oh dear. Yeah, I, th I think I so. I am not charming though. No, but I, I think so. Do I get a boost for having tea? You do get a boost for having tea. <laughs> yeah, you do get a boost for having tea. The difficulty, I think, is going to be one red, one purple. Also, whilst, because I'm still there, can you have a boost for the fact that I am charming? Yeah. <laughs> I'll throw in a J-Ren boost. That makes sense. Everyone likes talking shop. So that that's two success and one advantage. Yes, you do pick up some useful hints and tips on how to reuse various spares. Some tips of the trade that are known by, like, junkers and fringers. 
essentially fringe survival tips for working with old ships. The stuff that will be long-term damaging, but short-term will get you to port before you all suffocate. If right. you uh, take an empty bottle and, uh, and, and unscrew it and then just bash it against something hard, it, it loosens the carbon. You can put it back in for another 25 minutes, it works. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Brilliant. So, so I've got that in, in my mental backpack, basically, for future use. Brilliant. Yep. Thank you. No worries. So, as that evening starts to come towards a close, I think that's where we're going to end this session for today. And before we go completely, we want to do this episode's patron shout out. So this one goes out to Brit Knowles. Brit is wonderful, a friend to the show, as well as being a thoroughly lovely person. They are also playing Vestrano on Heroes of the Hydean Way, which, as will come as no surprise to any of our listeners, is one of our favourite shows and one of our favourite groups of people. So thank you very, very much for backing the show. And to everybody else, if you're not already listening to Here is the Hiding Way, and words inspired to do by our amazing crossover with them, go and give them a listen. It's a hell of a show. Um, so a bit of free advertising there for the show you're in as well, Britt. Thank you. Thanks. And we will see you all next time. Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Fantasy Flight Games and Lucas Books. Our intro music for this season is Unholy Night by Kevin MacLeod, and our outro music remains Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale, both used with gratitude under the Creative Commons license. If you like the show and want to interact with us, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, all of which are at Force Majeure Pod though Twitter is probably where you're going to find us more regularly. If you enjoy what we do and want to support the show, there's three ways you can do that. The first is via our Patreon at patreon.com slash force majeure pod. The second is by buying us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash force majeure pod. And the third way is by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere where you can find us. We really like reviews. It tells us that we're telling the stories that you want to hear and helps other people find us. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.